So that's why uh, Robert Smith's life is over. So when I say his life is over, I don't say I'm going to go kill him. But I'm going to ruin his life and look into his fucking kids. Barrett Brown spent more than four years in prison in no small part because of this YouTube video, in which he appears to threaten an FBI agent. But how did it even get to this point? Remember the hacker group Anonymous? The guys who wear Guy Fox masks and release ominous videos threatening to take down government agencies, corporations, and religions like Scientology? We are Anonymous. We are Legion. We do not forgive. Well, Brown rose to semi-fame when the media characterized him, not entirely to his liking, as the spokesman for Anonymous. It would be his association with hackers that would later land him in federal prison. But Bear Brown is actually not a hacker. He's more of a hybrid activist and investigative journalist. He first ran into trouble after he launched a crowdsourced research platform devoted to investigating the private intelligence sector. Think a privatized version of the NSA that counters perceived enemies of large corporations and governments. After a major email hack, Brown and his team uncovered and publicized a conspiracy amongst several of these private intelligence firms to, among other things, attack and discredit journalists. What exactly landed Brown in prison is a bit complicated, and we'll get to it later. But what's important to know for now is that Brown just got out in November and is already working as a journalist again, covering the city council for D Magazine in Dallas, Texas. But as is always the case with Barrett Brown, there might be more here than meets the eye. He says he's already working on a project to disrupt things in Dallas and way beyond. We met up with Barrett at the D Magazine headquarters to talk about his time in prison, the state of the private intelligence sector, and to get his read on America's current political situation and the role hackers and leakers have played in it. Barrett, thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you. Could you just give us an overview of what your impression of federal prison was? It was very educational to be within the confines of the government, to actually be there 24 hours a day, watching government officials walk around, uh, conduct themselves. It gave me additional perspective on how these people think, how an institution operates, in contrast to how it's supposed to operate. What were your, some of your observations about the prison guards and other uh, federal employees? Uh, they'll do whatever's convenient at any given time. Uh, I was uh, number. I spent about six months altogether in the SHU, in the Special Housing Unit, the whole, as it's more popularly known. Uh, a couple of those occasions entirely without justification. Uh, it was known that I was in there without justification. I was being retaliated against by a particular administration official, the assistant warden in this case, and these these fellows. Uh, staff there who generally approved of my work. Uh, they, all, they all read my column. They, they tend to actually have, uh, you might call, like sort of right libertarian views mm. to some extent. Nonetheless, we'll happily confine a journalist in the hole. They will do whatever's asked of them. And that's, that's important to know. It's important to keep in mind that, you know, we need to know about the apparatus we have, the personal apparatus we have in this country. We need, we need to know what cops will do, what ex-military people will do what bureaucrats will do, even when they don't agree with it. When we're going into a period of potential disarray, civic disarray, as we are now, we need to be thinking about those factors. A lot of uh, civil libertarians and uh, other critics of our prison system believe that the SHU, solitary confinement, is inhumane, cruel punishment. Do you think that that's a fair characterization based on your experience? Solitary confinement has been shown by countless studies, you know, to have a certain effect on people's uh, mentality, on their emotional life. Uh, I was very rarely in solitary confinement as such. It was, it, it's more common to have uh, a shoe set up where you have two people living in a cell. They do that for a number of reasons, one of which is space, one of which is to uh, make suicides more difficult. And people can get used to anything. That's, that's, the, that's the interesting thing about being a human being is that, you know, and we know this from history, is that people have to get used to and sometimes anything. So I can't say I suffered a great deal. I tried to take advantage of the situation as much as possible. I got some of my best work done in the shoe. Uh, but you know, that's, that's not possible for a lot of people. Not everybody has something they can, they can attend to while they're held back there. And oftentimes they're held back there far longer than they're supposed to, even according to BOP's own policy. I've seen it happen many, many times. That's one of several overlapping issues in the US prison system that need to be addressed. The fact that Obama had to come out and forbid uh, children from being held in the shoe or in solitary is telling about our society. That, that's not something that should have had to be done just now, and that's something that should have been addressed a long time ago. 
And you mentioned that uh, you were put in there often without explanation. At some point, your uh, email access was suspended, you believe, for communicating with a journalist about corruption in the Bureau of Prisons. You discovered through some FOIA requests that you were classified as an inmate of greatest concern. What does that mean and why do you think you were one? I was listed as a hacker which not even the DOJ claims I'm a hacker. Uh, I think the, the reasoning on that is it would have been kind of embarrassing to say, this guy's a journalist, he's writing about us, just be wary of him. You can't really make that explicit uh, a situation like that. And, and of course, the reason I was actually aware of that classification was I was told by, by a staff member, contrary to policy, uh, because I am a journalist. And one of my tactics, as opposed to hacking, is, is actually to develop sources among people who are unhappy with the institutions they work for. and that happen time and again within the prison system. That needs to be kept in mind both from people who actually support these institutions, it needs to be kept in mind by those of us who tend to oppose these institutions, that mm. there are fractures there that, that can be taken advantage of. They're not thinking as, as a Borg. They, 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 there's individuals here who disagree with a great deal of what they do and what their government does, but nonetheless continue to work for the government. Mm. Uh, those people generally aren't gonna be very useful. Uh, they tend not to have a strong moral center, uh, almost by definition. So. But these are all things that are going to come into play more and more as our civil society continues to fracture. Barrett Brown's arrest, like many of the more dramatic moments in his life, was caught on camera because it happened in the middle of a video chat he was leading. Oh, is Barrett getting fucking raided by the FBI? Holy Could you just describe what actually happened that night? We're doing a Project PM uh, video chat as I did uh, most evenings at that point, I heard a rustling at the door, opened it, and I see some sort of very confusing scene of a guy with a big metal shield and a faceplate, and there's yelling, and uh, they came in, knocked me over. Uh, my arm was under my chest. This SWAT team fellow uh, dug his knee into my back. You can hear me screaming on the video. Uh, my ribs were being pressed into my organs, and you can hear the audio of me you know, explaining that to him, and that I can't, uh, as he's requesting, move my arm put it behind my back because he's pressing down on my spine. Then it took me to the federal building. I had some injuries to my ribs that lasted for a few months. I had a bottom bunk pass because of that. I wasn't able to climb into a top bunk for a while. And uh, you know, that's about, I think, probably how a raid generally happens. I'm trying to imagine what the justification for a SWAT raid like that would be. Were they hoping to catch you in the act of hacking into a intelligence firm or something? It was just for fun. I mean, they have all this equipment. Uh, yeah. It costs a lot of money. You know, they don't get to necessarily use it as much as they perhaps would like to. Yeah. Um, and so when they get a chance to do it, they do it with gusto. Brown was somewhat famously charged for, among other things, sharing a link in a chat room to classify data that had been obtained in a hack of a private security firm called Stratford. Curiously, Stratford wasn't mentioned in the original search warrant, though. Brown believes that this was because they were actually interested in a different line of his work. He had launched a crowdsourced platform called Project PM to investigate the murky world of private intelligence contractors after the hack of a firm called HB Gary. Brown and his team discovered in the hacked emails that several of the firms joined together into a conglomerate called Team Themis. One of Team Themis's projects was to develop potential lines of attack against critical organizations like WikiLeaks and journalists like Glenn Greenwald and they detailed some of their methods in a PowerPoint presentation that Brown and his team distributed to the media. Brown believes that the Team Themis investigation is what put him on the Fed's radar. We know what this case was about. This case was about H.P. Gary. It was about in-game systems. It was about this large informal network of state and corporate uh, contractors and, and intelligence uh, officials who believed that we have too much freedom to speak out uh, against U.S. policy. What uh, is the public interest in knowing this information? We found executives and we found developers with these companies and we found government officials colluding against the U.S. public uh, in ways that have no, no defense. These technologies are still little understood, in many cases entirely unknown outside of a few companies, uh, and which have the ability to influence 
our national consciousness in ways that would have been impossible just a few generations ago. Explain that a little bit. What are some of the methods that we do understand now that they use to influence the public consciousness or, or public opinion? The most disturbing is persona management. This is something that came out of the H.P. Gary emails about a month after the original hacks. It was one of our main focuses. There was a contract put out by CENTCOM under the U.S. Air Force for companies to develop software and methodologies by which a single person sitting at a desk could control, say, 10 to 20 fake online people with, with names, backgrounds, uh, histories, uh, that the software facilitates their conversations uh, from day to day, as in they're able to maintain a certain, not just speak in a different language, you know, through translation software, but even maintain a particular cadence, uh, remember what was said. And that can be used in a number of different ways. I mean, if you've seen, you know, what can happen with a uh, single person just in, in a very primitive way creating sock puppets online in order to, you know, fake incidents, you know, and incidents are what drives our media coverage. Given the systemic problems with our media, when you start bringing in these alliances of companies that can now alter the public perceptions in, in ways that are still understood, we're, we're looking towards a period of extraordinary confusion, even beyond what we've had in the, in the recent past. One of the FBI's moves during the investigation was to charge Brown's mother with obstruction of justice for moving a laptop out of their view. He says this is what ultimately sent him over the edge and led him to create this bizarre three-part video series in which he appears to threaten the lead investigator on his case. The threats against an officer charge had stuck during the plea bargaining, during which Brown's legal team negotiated down from a maximum sentence of more than 100 years to 63 months. What was your mindset at that point when that video went out? Uh, I was on, I had gotten off heroin a while back. I was using Suboxone, which is a synthetic opiate, uh, to control my, my heroin addiction. Uh, and I was trying to get off Suboxone at that point. I also stopped taking an antidepressant called Paxil that I've been on for the past few months. And apparently when you do that, it kind of leads to a manic state. But the, the, the more important background on that was that, you know, for the past several months, I've been actively investigated by the FBI. They raided my apartment. They raided my mom's house. They'd taken a number of computers. They'd issued threats to indict my mother. I, I felt that at this point I was, I was going to go under and that my mother might, you know, go under as well. So I had given up, you know, conventional methods of, of bringing this to attention. I decided to make a video explaining all, everything that had happened, what had been done by, by certain people associated with H.P. Gary who had posted my, my actual address, which was hard to find at that point, and my mother's actual address for the Zetas during a point when the Zetas were supposedly going to come kill me because of this anonymous operation. The Zeta drug cartel, right. just to be clear. Yes, those would have been regarded as illegal had we done them against somebody. But the fact that these ex-military people were doing them and the fact that it was all kind of on Twitter and online, I guess perhaps struck many journalists as sort of amorphous internet drama as opposed to a real thing that actually mattered. Uh. So I'd given up uh, asking for help. I figured that my only option here is to lay everything out, explain what's happened. Uh, make an ultimatum, explain that if they come back again in conjunction with what I consider to be a criminal conspiracy against me, very similar to the criminal conspiracies we'd already exposed, that I would defend my household uh, against any FBI agents. In addition to that, separate from that, I also said that I was going to ruin this, uh, this uh, federal agent's life. I was going to do exactly what Aaron Barr had been shown to be planning against the families of activists as part of his Team Themis operation. It wasn't a violent threat, it was a threat to use these same methods. But ultimately, because the way the indictment was phrased, the way they cut out part of that sentence, and the way they conflated two different sentences from different ports of the video, uh, that was, that was the, the, the quote the press got was, was more ambiguous than the actual one I delivered, which could be seen on the video. And so there was this conception that I'd actually threatened to kill this agent. So these were all flimsy charges. Nonetheless, I did eventually plead to it because the alternative was to go to trial with FBI agents who had already lied about me several times on the stand uh, in, in different hearings. And that's generally, you know, you want to avoid that generally. There's been critiques of anonymous and WikiLeaks from all angles, but the one I'm most interested in hearing your response to comes from people like Glenn Greenwald and Edward Snowden who say that the uncurated release of information, releasing you know, innocent people's credit card information and so on, is actually damaging to the project of transparency. What's your response to that? On the whole, there's a number of reasons not to release huge, large uh, caches of information. Uh, one of which is that when you do, it's not very effective. It tends to work better if you release parts of it that you've analyzed or you release parts of it to different journalists you work with. And that's actually what WikiLeaks 
uh, and sometimes anonymous, for the most part, is done. I was always opposed to kind of the stuff that Lulsec did when they kind of went off the reservation right. in summer of 2011 and just started hacking things for fun. And that's really what it was. There were times when they would say, oh, we're doing this to remind you about security. Well, that, that's bullshit. They weren't doing that. I, I knew these guys. They were doing it for fun. And to some extent, uh, since it was being done in part under Hector Monsignor Sabu, who at that point was an FBI asset, there's reason to believe that that kind of behavior was encouraged by the FBI. But the FBI wouldn't have had to step in and get them to do that. That's the kind of stuff that segments of Anonymous had already done. When you have a, a activist movement that's really built on what was previously a trolling group, those are inevitable problems. And that was one of many reasons why at different times I detached myself uh, from what was going on Anonymous, uh, concentrated more on a group that I could you know, control to some extent, or at least know what it was doing. At least, you know, something I could say, this is something that I approve of. Since the four years have passed with you, you behind bars, I, I would say the world has gotten uh, even leakier. We've seen the impact that WikiLeaks has had on this past election. What's your reading on the election and the role that leaks played in it? I mean, now we're seeing the age of non-state actors sort of come, in, come into its own. We're seeing uh, this, this bizarre scenario in which individuals can you know, have a lever by which they can move large objects in ways that, again, this all comes from, from the information age and the fact that for the, for the first time in human history, any individual can collaborate with any other individual on the planet. And the implications of that are not yet fully realized, but I think with this past election, we're, we're seeing what that means. It's obviously a chaotic situation. It's an unpredictable situation. You can say that there's going to be more leaking. There's going to be continual leaking. Leaking will have a will, will play a role, and, and a, as that becomes more obvious, you'll have more institutional actors taking that into account, uh, whether it be these new uh, methods, some of which came out of the H.P. Gary emails, uh, by which companies are going to try to prevent leaking before it happens using predictive technology. Uh, there will also be a number of civic insurgent groups, as you might call them, that will, that will take advantage of these factors as well, just like they have with Anonymous and WikiLeaks, other uh, groups. Uh, you're going to see more of the same in that regard. In addition to his work covering local politics at D Magazine, Brown is working on a book and collaborating with other activists to create something called The Pursuance Project, a decentralized activism network applying lessons he learned from Anonymous and Project PM to affect media and public policy. It's going to sort of provide some rigor to this new dynamic whereby anybody can collaborate with anybody else. You just imagine a, a empty space and a user creates in that empty space a, a square. That square is the sort of constitution slash DNA of this group he's creating called a pursuance. Mm -hmm. That group at that point could be anything. It could be a prison reform network. It could be uh, uh, something for your local city to organize opposition to a certain policy or many policies. So you have a square here. This is the DNA. Here's a circle representing the person who created it. Uh, he can have spokes running off himself. Um, let's say one of these is one of this is press relations. One of these is research. Rather than feeling that you are a citizen of this particular country for whatever reason, and then having to contend with your neighbors who may or not be fascists, this is something where everybody's on the same page, where everybody at every step of the way has the right to be there, has the right to leave, uh, and ultimately can expect to see their ultimate political goals accomplished uh, in ways that we've already seen on a small scale with Anonymous, that we've seen with, with other groups of that nature. This is something that systematizes that. This is something that takes this, this huge river of information and channels it in ways that make sense. But the, the point is you need to be thinking about how we reform the wider society, rather ambitiously if necessary, look at what we have, assess the environment, and uh, start building something else. Barrett Brown, I look forward to reading the book and seeing uh, this project come to fruition. Uh, and I want to thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. For Reason, I'm Zach Weissmuller.